Hmm. Okay. Hey, Stacy. Hi, hi. I'm surprised we're the only ones here. Are we in the right place? <laughs> wow, yeah, well, look at that. What happened this morning? <laughs> Hello. That is, that is not, that is not Jerry. <laughs> Where is Jerry? Did somebody yes, say it's Jerry? Yeah, <laughs> he is. Hey, gang. Hello. Well, you look serious today. Greetings. Is everything okay? Uh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm I'm being stupid about my priorities and like not making enough revenues for the family. So that's actually a crisis. But other than that, things are good. It's nice to be retired. Holy smokes. Mm, yeah. Yeah. This is. Uh... It's a, it makes an amazing difference if you don't have to worry about uh, where the next uh, paycheck's coming from. Yeah. Good program, that is. In time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, hey, everyone. Did everyone see the announcement to go use a spreadsheet for today for how we check in and all that? Um, and I'm going to move myself. Oops. I rebooted my machine, so I've got to reopen Metamost. And go to the calls channel. There we go. Da -da -da. And uh, my spreadsheet says that Klaus is, uh, so I've got, I, I, it's funny because when we do a spreadsheet for signups, um, I think few people are gonna actually use the spreadsheet to sign up, but, uh, but now we have Klaus and Parmjit. So why don't we just start that way and see if anybody else wants to sign up as we talk, uh, please do so. Uh, and we will use this. Uh, so the spreadsheet is not just before the call, it's actually to be used uh, during as we move. And as we hit topics, if you come up with a breakout topic you'd like to suggest, put that in the spreadsheet as well. Hey, Parmjit. Glad you're here. Um, so uh, Klaus, you've got, the, you've got the con. I do. <laughs> you do, I know, I know, you do. <laughs> um, well, I think my 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 uh, big thing this week is the Menus of Change initiative at Harvard, uh, combined with the Culinary Institute of America, and uh, I'm going to put uh, should I put it in the chat or I'm, let me put it in the chat right now. In the Mattermost chat would be great. Yeah, where's the Mattermost chat? That is right here. Okay, so am I in the right place? Did I put it in the right place? You just put that in, yes, exactly correct. Okay, good, good. So when you look just at, at the topics <clears throat> that, are, that are highlighted in this menus of change, I mean, you can't imagine how radical this is unless you are really in the, this is, this is the leading conference to corporate America food service. I mean, this is where the corporate chef and the food and beverage director for Marriott Hotels, for Disney, for McDonald's go for the annual uh, the conference. Oh. And and when you when and and the what totally got me excited was the opening speech by Jeffrey Sachs. Um, and I'm not sure if this is behind the wall because I had to register for it. But uh, see if this if this will open up here. Um, and, and if you have a chance later on um, to look at the opening uh, session where Jeffrey Sachs was addressing it, he actually was saying things like Coca-Cola, Nestle, PepsiCo are the, are the new coal companies of the 21st century. 
Wow. So food is the new food is the new coal. Food is the new coal. That is amazing, you know, because when I worked at Disney, um, I mean, one time I, I was uh, they put me uh, uh, onto a project of socially responsible merchandising for children, right? So I was, and that was international for all the theme parks in in France, Japan, and so on, and. I had to partner with Coca-Cola and Nestle, you know, because they, they are corporate alliance partners for, for Disney and they spent like you know, 30, 40 million dollars each you know, to, to have their products featured in the theme parks. So, so this has come a really long way you know, to, to uh, acknowledge the damage these companies are doing in the, in the food system and by that, with that, not just in agriculture, but also in the health of the population. So that that was um, um, that was astonishing. The other thing is, um, yesterday I participated in a call with the Global uh, um, Regeneration Collab uh, with David Witzel, and uh, Gil was on there as well. He's not here now. Um, and they are forming a team to um, participate in the challenge that Elon Musk was just putting out, uh, putting up a $100 billion fund to come up with ideas for uh, carbon sequestration. And uh, the, I mean, the, the, the uh, only really viable thing that hasn't been done yet uh, at scale is uh, to change the food system and, and the way we, we interact with nature. That was also a comment that Jeffrey Sachs was making um, he, uh, in, in, in his comments. He was saying that he and, and the, the uh, academic group in general has focused on the energy systems for most uh, of uh, these years. And it is now coming to the forefront that it is literally impossible to meet the IPCC goals for 2050 uh, without land use management changes, without land use changes. And land use, of course, is uh, uh, primarily, I mean, instantly, first off, uh, agriculture, agroforestry, before anything else. Yeah. So I think we're on a good path. Um, but now comes the question, how, how do you communicate this out? Right? So we had the, the Institute for um, Evolutionary Leadership this week has Noah Bateson on, and we had you know, discussions yesterday to prepare for a conversation we have with Noah Bateson tomorrow, uh, where we, we were able to, to uh, formulate uh, questions for her. Now, and, uh, um, I was uh, uh, leading, I mean, I was like discussion lead for, 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 for one group, there are five groups. Um, and my, my, my summary was, um, if storytelling is, or if, if story is the guiding force for, for people to behave or to guide, to, to, to guide our actions, our, the way we perceive the world around us, the, the, the way we respond to stimuli, then how do we get story about you know, climate change and the environment and so on into the public in ways that make them actually respond? Um, and, and Noah Bateson and, and other uh, thinkers have uh, been focused on, it's a one-on-one one -on -one uh, thing, right? I mean, you have to convince one person at a time. And to me, that sort of doesn't make any sense because when you look at the power of propaganda to, to incite masses of people you know, to collaborate and also in the way that Yuval Harari defines storytelling as the clue that allows mass movements, right? That allows uh, millions of people to collaborate around the same idea. So the question to me then is, um, how do we get away from this one-on-one, -on -one, which, uh, you know, I mean, we have been doing this for how many decades now, trying to help people understand what climate change is all about and, and create a mass movement to where the information becomes uh, effectively a, a propaganda tool 
but for the good this time, you know, because propaganda is neutral. It's just, it can be used for good and bad. So that will be uh, an interesting part of the conversation tomorrow. You know, how can we shift from this um, one-on-one -on -one, um, and reach out to people and find people in their space, you know, where they are. And with that uh, comes to mind uh, spiral dynamics, right? Because uh, we have to uh, uh, talk with people uh, within their context. That means you, we have to translate uh, the information in ways that it becomes alive uh, to, to people in different parts of the economy, different parts of society, uh, and and uh, and find meaning. And I use the example of energy. You know, we have spent several decades uh, educating the public on turning down the thermostat, insulating your house, you know, driving a more energy efficient car. I mean, when you think about energy, we have a, a, a deep seated, almost instinctive understanding what it is, where it comes from. You know, there are coal fired power plants and all of those things. We do not have that understanding when it comes to food and when it comes to uh, the way that uh, our, our uh, behavior, our, our, um, our preferences you now impact uh, the, the entire environment in, in, around us. So in a nutshell, that was sort of my week so far. That's cool. You have a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Um, I put a link to Nora Bateson in my brain. She's super interesting. She has a whole riff on warm data about how the context that data emerges in is really important. I don't know enough about it to, to explain a bunch, but I'm interested in, you know, maybe at uh, next, week, next week's check-in, how Nora, the conversation with Nora went and what you all learned and, and so forth. And then um, I'm putting right now in the Mattermost chat an article about a, a field trip that was done on a ship uh, out to the Pacific Gyre. And I'm just being introduced to one of the guys who organized this trip, uh, who works uh, for the Ocean Plastics Leadership Network, OPLN. And I'm mentioning all this because what they did and, and the food systems uh, industries, participants may already have done this, may not, I don't know. And I don't, don't know what the equivalent is. But what they did was they took a whole bunch of corporations and lobbied for them to like get on board this ship. They had 150 people on the ship, took them out to the Pacific Gyre, put up, put, put them into like uh, snorkels and fins uh, and chucked them out into the, into the gyre, into the plastics and a bunch of other things. And then they sat and talked and they had to bunk together. So like the guy from Nestle was with the, the guy from Green, the person from Greenpeace uh, and things like that. And apparently it was really interesting. Now there was nobody on board ship from big oil, so no petroleum companies, but the whole trip was about plastics uh, from, you know, at all scales and plastics are um, sort of far worse for the environment than anybody thought they were. Um, and it's really hard to get them out of the oceans. So one of the big movements is about how to prevent them from getting into the oceans anymore to at least not keep making the situation worse. Uh, but, but the trip sounded really interesting. And I know some of the players, uh, I learned about this from a friend, Tom Gruber, who was on board ship as kind of the photographer for the trip. And he's not, he's a, his side dish is a photographer. He's also the co-creator of Siri and he's, he helped sell Siri to Apple. And I've known him for a really long time, super smart guy, uh, but he was the photographer. So he, he, and he's done some beautiful nature photography, underwater photography, all that kind of stuff. But turning this into a, a shared experience that allows for a lot of time for these people to rub against each other and get to know each other and try to solve problems together feels like a fruitful thing. And Klaus, I don't know if you've uh, seen things like this happening around food or if it's interesting, but uh, um, I know some of the people sort of uh, involved in this kind of thing. Yeah, um, no, I, 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 that, that hasn't happened yet. Um, and, and I think, I mean, plastic is one thing, you know, that I was uh, actually looking at, I forgot what, where, but it is possible to change plastics composition so it becomes degradable and reusable. And that's simply an investment decision. 
you know, and companies don't make the investment decisions because they're not forced to, and it just costs more money. But but the the so plastic the plastic problem can be solved, uh, but it will require significant investment, uh, and and so far you now there is no will for that. I mean, in the food business, but but that's that's just like you know investing, and it doesn't change the business model. You know, it's just it's just. Uh, doing something, the problem in the food business is when you look at a company like McDonald's, you know, they have something like 34,000 restaurants, which are basically all serving the same core food. Uh, and their business model thrives on um, an industrial form of standardization, you know, where the kitchens themselves are basically assembly lines. There's nothing being cooked. Uh, they don't have a knife in there to cut a tomato. You know, it, it all comes in from the outside, frozen, uh, 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 ready to serve. Uh, the sauces are made in huge batches in factories and all of that. And so for them, the idea of sourcing fresh local food is a massive sh challenge to their business model. The entire uh, uh, industrial supply chain is has vertically integrated into complementary structures and the ownership behind those structures you know is very centralized i mean these are people that they're so beyond rich you can't even you know fathom this but when you look at uh, from tyson foods you know where uh, you get uh, the breeder stock or monsanto which make uh, gmo driven seeds and sell the chemicals to raise them you know all the way through the supply chain uh, Cargill and, and, and then Nestle and so on. Um, for them, you, you pull one part out of this chain and the entire thing crashes, right? So that's the problem they're faced with. And now that's just, so this is what we call, I guess, uh, creative destruction, which, will, which is phasing the industry. You know, and they are fighting as hard as the oil industry to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things I think you just described happening is that uh, we're de-skilling the whole chain, meaning that if nobody in the kitchen anymore knows how to wield a knife and do like the chef's work, what they're doing is assembly, then you can't actually, uh, you can't actually do the work of cooking in a normal way in that kitchen. So the whole, the whole system is, is, has got to be reconfigured, which is, which is a huge challenge. And, and you reminded me of an article I read yesterday, which I just posted in the chat about ExxonMobil and this little activist hedge fund called Engine Number no. One um, that just won three seats on mobile's board by lobbying really, really hard, crossing their fingers hard during the board meeting elections, and suddenly they're represented. And... Um, that's really interesting as well, because when you need to tip large enterprises, one way to do it, um, you know, cranky though boards are, one way to do it is to get on, the, on their boards. And I don't know if anybody's doing that in the food system. I mean, I would love to be on Monsanto slash Bayer's board. I, I would wreak havoc there. Um, that would be a great fun thing. Um, yeah, the, the problem again is that the, the energy sector is well understood. So this kind of activism you know, is the outcome of decades of lobbying against uh, these oil industries, where finally there is enough public support you know, to do something here. And, and uh, the investment industry also, I mean, BlackRock has been supporting this guy. So, so th th there, there is enough support. The food industry is not fully, is not understood. You know, the, the public does not get the link between uh, how we how we consume food or the types of foods we consume and the damage that does in the to the environment and and the emissions it creates uh, on top of it right so so there there is a, a huge education gap uh, a communications gap with the public in this regard that makes it very difficult to i mean when you when you think of a, of my now I mean my gosh I worked for the Walt Disney Company for twenty one years right. And by all means, uh, to them, brand image is everything, right? I mean, uh, you couldn't, you could not say anything or do anything that was impinging with the uh, public persona that uh, the brand, uh, that corporate branding was uh, 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 nurturing, right? And so, but still, they are able to 
bring our child meals with Coca-Cola and Nestle, right? And no one catches on to that and, and do Kellogg's cereals you know, for, for children's breakfast, which is 40% sugar. And, and so until the public begins to understand that, the moment there is a breakthrough here, uh, Disney will be one of the first companies to, to exit you know, this, uh, uh, this existing strategy and shift into something else. But so far, the, the pressure simply doesn't exist. Um, and I realize I'm monopolizing our conversation. I apologize. Anybody else uh, with thoughts for, for Klaus and where he is in the food system uh, and all of that? Um, failing that, and, and uh, Eve, thanks for joining us. Um, he's an, a dear old friend of mine. And uh, we're just doing a check-in and today we changed our protocol a little bit. We put a spreadsheet up for signing up for checking in. Usually I just sort of go through the gallery view myself and just kind of pick my way through, trying to find people who didn't get a chance to check in previous week and put them up first and stuff like that, but we're, we're moving it around. And then we're going to do 45 minutes of, of plenary and then break up into uh, breakouts. And I'm just realizing that I need to ping Hank to make me a host because we're in somebody else's Zoom, not mine. So I can figure that out, but I'm doing that on the side. And the second person in the batting order for Q is Parmjit. Hi. Uh, what what do you want me to do? Like update or? Um, sure. What sort of what OGME things uh, have been happening for you? And uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, you know, for us to put in front of us or anything like that. Okay. Um, I'll just do a quick comment. Um, uh, um, following Klaus's um, uh, information, that's really really interesting. I don't like football at all. In fact, I'm not a sporty person in any way, shape or form. But it's interesting. It's an interesting observation that in the UK, it was a footballer who um, rashid somebody who stood up for the fact that children were starving in the UK because of you know, the way the economy is going and food banks. And he, he's actually put pressure on the government to, to put policies in place so that children can be fed. So that's a really interesting thing to see. And also it was a footballer who during one of the interviews um, took the bottle of Coke off from the camera view and um, chose a uh, glass of water to drink. So yeah, you know, maybe football's got a place in the world after all, as far as I'm concerned. Um, let me maybe uh, talk a little bit about this. Where's the book? Ah. Okay, so here's a book called The Lucas Plan. Uh, and it's by a lady called Hilary Wainwright um, and, and somebody else that I haven't met called David Wilk, D uh, Dave Elliott. So in the 70s, um, Lucas Aerospace was um, like facing redundancies and all the rest of it because of the financial situation. And um, Hillary came up with a Lucas plan, which is all about instead of everyone losing their jobs, why don't we like try and find as a community, what can they build that's gonna be good and all the rest of it and help society. And basically this book is all about how management and political will um, stop that process from happening. And so in the end, like the conglomerates and corporations got their way and so on. So where I live in Coventry, um, a similar thing is happening now, but with the Rolls Royce workers. And so management want uh, them to lose 10% um, of their pay um, lose their kind of job security and then after that the whole thing will be sold off and uh, shut down and probably stuff's going to be starting to be made in China for much cheaper and like they're not worried about global warming they don't want to think about anything green for another 10 years and so you know you're, you're battling up against this kind of mindset so um, what we've been doing is trying to support the workers in Rolls-Royce um, and on the 3rd of July we're, we're going to have a contingent come down 
all the way from Glasgow, which is miles away from where we are, just so that uh, we can have like a, a workshop and a chat about, let, let's talk about like the Lucas Report Mark II and having learnt from all, all the things that could go wrong, um, you know, maybe Marcus Rashford. Yes, thank you for Kennedy. He was the footballer. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this is quite an exciting kind of um, project that's happening at Grassroots. So we're going to see what kind of plan we can come up with. And more importantly, like who, who can we find that's going to stand behind it? Because until we get people understanding the significance of, of, of these kind of everyday things that are going on and, and, and putting their foot down and saying, you know, it, it, it makes no sense, you know, we're behind the workers and, and so on. Um, things aren't going to change, so I'll let you know. And uh, one, one quite interesting thing is I've managed to get my local Gurdwara, which is um, like a, a Sikh temple, religious community so they they've agreed to give us um a room because they've got an educational kind of um set of buildings so i'm hoping that um that can be a way to for the message to reach down to kind of ordinary people but you know we'll see how it goes so that's one of the things happening in my world i love that um i'm out that that's a really generative thing you've just put on the table and i just wanted to instead of me jumping in which i'm which i which i'm about to because i've got a lot of things i wanted to ask and say about what you put on i'm going to go quiet for a second and see who else would like to um who else, who else like, would like to comment on this eric it looks like go ahead well not directly on this sorry maybe it's better if you comment first because i have a question of something that happened in three meetings before oh okay i'll, I'll come back to you eric um phil yeah, I, I just want to, to echo the sentiment around um, mm -hmm. soccer and how it relates to the, the work, I think, with the videos that we've been talking about as well and, and talking about how that inspires change and kind of, as Klaus has mentioned a couple of times, getting young people and getting influencers involved. Like, I know R Ronaldo is a huge star, but that single act, uh, I think it dinged Coke's stock, stock value by $4 billion. It, it was a pretty substantial impact. So, like, getting people who are already interested about these topics involved in these conversations, I think, um, would go a long way um, in making change. Uh, obviously, that's, that's a known thing. And then just on the, on the UK side, um, a friend of mine recently mentioned the Transition Network. It's, it's not too big in the US right now, but it's, it's a group that's fairly active in the UK. And I think that could be another group for us to, to try and learn a bit from. But thanks very much. That's awesome. Anyone else on this topic? Um, so let me, uh, a, a couple things. I had the Lucas plan in my brain, but only the, 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 little, the littlest tip of it. But, but um, what you were saying was, was triggering a whole bunch of other memories. Uh, one is that, um, for example, most famines are economic. They're not Calamities like like communities store grain. They they communities groups of people together do their best to, to save for crises. Um, the the Great Bengal Famine, uh, like there was plenty of rice in the granaries. There was plenty of food around. Nobody had money to buy it, and the British would not release the food. And insane numbers of people died of starvation. Um, I'm reading a book called uh, I mentioned this I think on last week's last week's call. It's called The, the Anarchy. And it's about uh, the, the taking over of India by uh, the French and the British. First, it turns out first the French started getting militaristic, then the British. And in its detail, it's absolutely fascinating. It's like I had, I had in my mind a really broad brush, massive sweep story. And this book is helping me at least put smaller strokes on it. And still I'm no historian, I'm no authority on this topic, but, but, the degree to which humans have got run contrary to what's good for humans over and over and over again in the world is astonishing. That never mind slavery, never mind all the other, you know, systemic racism, uh, all the other kinds of things that are going on. So, so we ignore 
really interesting alternative forms of organization. And if they require things like land reform, because you're like, you know, land management and land use is really important in, in making progress on climate change. Yes, and that is just this gigantic political hot potato that we don't seem to be able to conquer because the crisis is not critical enough and, and, and disaster is not actually happening, never mind looming. Disaster is not actually happening to force people off the land or to make the land worthless, you know, uh, so that nobody cared that it got refactored or reused or something like that. It's weird. Humans are, are terrible at this collect and, and politics tends to trump. Uh, and I'm using that word advisedly. Politics tends to trump our ability to cooperate, to do things that might actually be good for humanity in the long run. Patrick, Patrick did you want to jump back in? Uh, there's the farmers' crisis going on in the Punjab right now, where they're trying to take over the use of um, the land that the farmers have been doing. Yeah, and people, you know, they're not getting it, are they? They're not getting it. And as I understand it, the current farmers' rebellion is that there was a government subsidy program that guaranteed them a minimum price for their grain. And there was a bill in uh, Indian Congress to get rid of that subsidy, which would mean throwing the farmers into the open market where, and I have a thought in my brain that basically says that small farmers have been under siege worldwide forever. Like you don't wanna be a peasant almost anywhere on earth because you are the people that everybody rings dry. Um, and, and so I think the farmers were like, ah, we're, we're going to be naked and we're, we're all, you know, this is gonna be cataclysmic. But it's interesting that they're, they're defending a government protection system that was there for them which was actually helping them maintain, actually helping them sort of stay in place. That's my understanding of the, of the, of the crisis. I think the propaganda is probably gonna show the government in a good light. Um, and the other thing I've noticed about governments is that they will extend a biscuit, you know, in, in, in place of a, a meal, but then they'll take that biscuit away quite soon afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Doug? Well, yeah, uh, trying to be thoughtful about all this. The Rolls-Royce workers probably should not be making cars, uh, which means that their jobs should go away. Uh, a lot of land reform means pushing current use like cows off in order to grow food. All these have people who lose out in the transition process. And we need to do something to protect people who are losing their livelihood and uh, place to live uh, through the, tra the transition. Uh, it's costly, but I don't see any other way. I don't think people are resisting because they don't understand it. I think they're resisting because they don't see how they're going to make a living uh, in any proposed future. So better to just hold on. So we've got to find a way to protect people who are losers in the transition. Which is, which weirdly, one of my arguments about white privilege uh, is that to white people who have a lot of privilege, all of these movements out there from Black Lives Matter to Me Too to everything else feel like loss. Loss of status, loss of privilege, loss of position, possibly loss of job, who knows. Uh, you know, they just feel like loss. And so your general statement, Doug, I completely agree with is that to, to, to cause things to shift and change, we need to take care of the people who will be losing things. And I don't know what take care of means. I'm, in, I'm really interested in what take care of means in that context, because one approach is, well, let's just give everybody a basic income and, and have done with it. Uh, uh, you know, and there are lots of other sorts of things that might come up. Uh, so Klaus, Klaus and then Shimon. Yeah, <clears throat> the, the, I had uh, to, to respond to what Doug was just saying. You know, the business climate leaders, citizen climate group, they asked me to put together a webinar on biofuels um, with the idea and, and partnered with a guy who used to be the CEO of a biofuel company, an ethanol fuel company. Well, I you know, dived into the research and <clears throat> we. Um, had to back off because when you look at the statistics, currently there's 38 million acres of uh, corn being grown for biofuel. That's the size of the state of Iowa. Okay? Uh, that takes uh, resources for water because some of that is being irrigated with the Ogallala Aquifer, which is being depleted. 
So in 2022, the uh, current mandate uh, uh, or the current support structure for the USDA for the corn ethanol industry is going to expire. And this will be a huge political fight, obviously, because basically these corn ethanol farmers, which are huge farmers by right, operating 10, 20,000 acres of land, um, are going to be faced with we are, no, more, no more government subsidies. So, so I was saying, why would we step into this mess, right? And, and there's a no-win political uh, scenario there. I said, why don't we shift course and instead focus on um, structural changes that are happening in the economy? So for example, we can say that current um, trend lines on water, you know, water becoming such a precious source will mean that we cannot grow any kind of, of food crop uh, to make biofuel because it, nothing that impedes with the food supply. But on the other hand, there is this exciting research in the European Union just commissioned the first um, biomass fuel, a, a, a biomass plant that converts biomass, which is a waste product that goes into the dump and creates methane gas and use that instead to create uh, uh, alcohol uh, uh, for jet fuel. Right, so there, so th then you have algae, which is uh, uh, being developed uh, as a uh, source for biofuels. So why don't we, just like in the energy sector, the coal plants shut down, but then you do wind and solar instead, right? So why don't we show how the economy is shifting into a direction where some uh, things will just have to go away, but other things are opening up and, and, and help people see the future, you know, help people understand where the economy is drifting. So to maintain uh, a sense of support and positivity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Shimon, then Eric, then Stacy. Yeah, uh, just in response to a couple of the comments that were made and then it's sort of connected to what I'm working on right now. A couple of things that I've noticed, actually the Wall Street Journal had an article about the SEC actually requiring major companies to report on their environmental liability moving forward. I think that's been a tremendous uh, game changer in other industries and can be environmentally as well. So in addition to investor, active investors joining boards, that requirement with people following up on it can be really important. The other thing that I've been following, which is also relevant to this conversation, is that insurance companies are starting to question how to insure some of those corporations that could potentially have liability because of the way they're impacting the environment and things of that kind. Again, pushing those organizations through either the insurance companies or SEC would be very important. The point that I really want to sort of like uh, share or the what I'm working on, which is very relevant to what's being discussed about workers moving forward is actually I presented uh, last week at the International Conference on Salutogenesis, my work on the opiate epidemic. I find that what's happening in the States for those who are not familiar with the opi epidemic is essentially a canary in the coal mine kind of thing of what's gonna happen when people are gonna start losing work, communities are gonna disintegrate, there's gonna be loss of organizing institutions for people to make meaning out of their lives. And invariably, we're gonna probably face bigger and more diverse what I think Case and Angus called the uh, diseases or death of despair. And in their book, Death of Despair and the Role of Capitalism, I think it's sort of like a little roadmap. Anyways, I've been actually working on the issue of the opiate epidemic, which was also actually an issue in Scotland when they uh, closed some of the coal mines and started sort of like focusing on how to make people have meaning and purpose in their lives. So I've been focusing on it for the last five years and July, this July, I'm actually gonna make more public my work on a citizens commission and other ways to sort of like engage with the opiate epidemic in a way that's meaningful for people. 
So anyone's interested can share more on that. Thank you, Shimon. And if you can put some links, to, if you have an uh, article, you know, posts or videos or other things that are that are the result of your work, we'd love to see them and link them up. Um, thank you, uh, Eric and Stacy. Mine is going to be vaguely related, to, <laughs> but it's like a more overarching thing, an associative thinking with what I heard it say. Um, I have only recently heard about the VCO. I don't know if you what the VCO is. It's a trade organization started in Holland. And what this surprised is, me... This is the Dutch East Indies Trading Company, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. One. I, I never knew how powerful, how big it was. Really? It was apparently as big as all... Like, if you... Relatively speaking, the amount of money that went through it it's as big as our current corporations put together, our biggest corporations like um, <laughs> Apple, uh, <laughs> all the big ones uh, together. They were huge and so much money went through them. And in about in a few hundred years, they were bankrupt. They were declared bankrupt. And their po policies and ways of dealing with natives, with people, was just mainly slavery and just taking whatever they could and selling it somewhere else for incredibly high margins, like spices and, and other commodities. And just this, this amount of, what strikes me there is the amount of aggression that the whole economic system has. And it just does what it does whenever it can, do and this kind of force i wonder what is like the there's right now there's like corporate social responsibility there is uh, taxes there is um uh, also in holland now there is the that the government didn't do enough for climate change that can be challenged but i wonder like what is the force that can really turn those bigger companies to to make to really change and shift their perspectives on how to deal with all of it in a more ethical way. So I, I wonder if ethical taxes is the way, is, is that the, the strongest force or is it these liabilities or when will there be like a, a big enough leverage for the most fundamental changes to take place? And that's like an open, an open thought that I have, like what, what's really the strongest Thing that we can have to change the change the attitudes. Um, Eric, thank you. I, I think I think you're voicing uh, uh, nicely a way of looking at the major questions that many of us are looking at. It's like, how what lever do we push on to change the system toward being better for humanity? It's like, really, yeah. where's the le where's the lever? And and, and that and would, would in the back of my mind, like whenever there is a business opportunity, it, it will be taken. So it's a very strong force. And aggression will always be there. Like, so how how do you then push up against the pressure of, exactly. of, the, of the opportunism? Yeah, um, I, to I totally agree. Very no, but, yeah. This this I think I've mentioned this before, but one of my favorite Peanuts cartoons has Lucy getting her test in school, and it says, "Explain World War II," and then the line below it says, "Use both sides of the page if necessary." Yeah. <laughs> Because um, this is a giant, giant question. It's, this is really, this is really the question uh, about what, it, how do we organize society for the next uh, couple hundred years, right? Yeah, and but I wonder if there's like one large leverage point. That's maybe also a question that's like with, with all of this. And I'm ambivalent on that. I'm ambivalent on that because uh, Milton Erickson was a hypnotist therapist back in the Great Depression, who was known for uh, basically. Uh, inducting people into trance and then offering their unconscious some alternative behaviors. And then uh, he had some miracle cures. He had people that he would just do one, one induction with and then they would change their behaviors. And I've been looking for what's the equivalent for society. And I'm, land, and I'm landing on if we could convince people that we are actually interdependent humans sharing a large home called the earth instead of rugged individuals who's, who are competing against other people in households for scarce resources. If we can cause that flip, a bunch of other stuff tumbles. And yet, 
I don't think that's the only place. And I think one of the conclusions we're coming to in conversations like this in OGM is we need to push everywhere all the time together. And one of those is going to, in retrospect, be the lever that sort of tipped us. Um, Doug, and then I wanted to go to Stacy, and then we're at time to, to head to breakouts. Well, Jerry, uh, you're proposing that people change their minds. My view is that that doesn't make any difference. Uh, it's not about thoughts. Uh, it's about actions. And how we get from thoughts to actions is our sticky point. Um, I, I'd love to know the next couple sentences. Like, do you have a, what's your favorite path to get from thoughts to actions? Because every, everybody's frozen on this. There are, there are hundreds and hundreds of entities, organizations, white papers, uh, proposals, manifestos to try to get people to do the right thing. And yet, here we are. Well, I don't think we can persuade them with thoughts. I think that we're going to see systems collapsing and people are going to gather in the street and talk about what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So Eric recommends putting LSD in the water, which or psilocybin. I mean, it's not more natural, right? Sounds reasonable. Um, Stacy? Yeah. So just to go to what Eric was saying, um, and this might sound naive, but what would it look like if corporations were taxed based on how many people they employed and the proportions between the highest earners and the lowest earners? So oh just, my God, if their tax rate varied by the differential between highest and lowest paid? So that would, that's something I think you could get most people behind that idea. It sounds there, fair, it makes there's, sense. There's a wrinkle to that which is that for a lot of executives, they really don't care about the cash compensation, the thing we all call salary. They really only care about the options packages because those are so gigantic in comparison. And your options package value varies wildly with the stock actual price in the, in the market. So that those numbers like are all over the place, but the payoff is so gigantic. So if you could wrap in the, the, the share of ownership of the enterprise into that measure, I think that would help a whole bunch. Because what we have is companies that are being managed for the benefit of the few largest shareholders who turn out to be the, the executives who got these monster uh, stock packages. Yeah, and I'm also really focused on the numbers of people employed. Like I was reading about that, um, I forgot how many billion dollar business, they employed 500 people. That's, that's crazy. But anyway, what I, that's not what I wanted to say. What, what my comment was really about, you know, we've been talk, bringing it back to OGM and what we could do. Because I had been thinking yesterday that it would be really interesting, you know, going towards the videos, if we took people that were interested in soil and food and farming and paired them in a call with those people that are working on economic things, like, for example, could the template that Kevin's using in his project be used in farming communities? And just as a group brainstorming, could we come, you know, just you know, just an imaginarian type of thing. Could we come up with something that would really be interesting and of value to all the people in that work group? So you're describing where I'm hoping we're steering OGM, which is to have sort of a project interest. We were sort of calling them quests. We're trying to find new language for it. But, but how do we focus people together? And then how do we find resources in the world that are really useful and really good and then make them even more usable and visible to everyone else? So if there's a template for Kevin's projects for funding for people who don't have a rich, you know, rich, rich fam family and uncle, uh, then let's make that replicable and usable and adaptable locally so that it's not a blueprint that has to be followed exactly, but it's a series of, of, of tools that people can use. And I think also, let's then leave experts at hand who can be hired in to do those things. And I think a big piece of the new economy is people who discover what their skills are and are, are available worldwide to provide those skills for compensation for everybody around the world. Um, yes. And I, I'm hoping that'll work. So I think we need to prototype more of that and get more legs under us to get that done. Well, so the last thing I just wanna say is, let, it, it starts right here with us. Like just, like, let's just try it just with us and get the people dynamics worked out. Um, I, I, I agree. And, and Phil, we got, we got to work cut out. Yeah, you're next. Yeah, to that point, uh, in terms of what we can do, 
Um, I think obviously if we could bring in certain levels of taxes, certain kind of governmental reforms, that's a great step. But for us as individuals and for those that have organizations, I think, I mean, groups like OGM are a great place to start kind of coalitions or co-ops of, of organizations and people that only agree to work with people that are following certain standards or for certain. So what kind of what Stacey outlined with the, the pay scale, there's things like B, B Corp certification that's kind of a carrot way of doing that. Like you become a B Corp, you, you, can, you can only have so much disparity between the highest and lowest paid people. You, like you have to have that to be a B Corp. But maybe if we can create some sort of functioning co-op or a coalition of people that hold certain standards in terms of regenerative practices, uh, eco-friendly practices, that um, employee, employee friendly practice, I think that's a great first step that we can actually take, um, but just, just to put that out there. And we're, I think we're, we're slowly, too slowly moving in that direction. I mean, we have the generative commons conversations on Wednesdays that are trying to figure out what is the set of agreements and can we, can we glue together a series of other umbrella ideas about how to work together in this new environment. Uh, and then we've got uh, Klaus is leading conversations into how do we rethink the food system and we're trying to figure out who runs something that turns into uh, an action oriented uh, venture there. Um, there are only 11 of us, which I don't know if that uh, is good for breakouts or if we should just continue in plenary uh, and keep going. And I think it depends a bit on whether there are a couple topics that uh, we would like to split into. Uh, the next person who was in the queue for plenary, but we were sort of out of what was going to be plenary time is Mark Thibault, who had to drop off the call. And I love he put his name as, as name in as Mark El Condor Thibault, which I think is great. Um, and we had question we in the breakout topics, we had spiral dynamics. What specifically what does spiral dynamics tell us about storytelling? Uh, to update and look at existing quests. Uh, should one study Greek classical literature? Is it a good idea or a bad idea? And also is woke culture going too far? All interesting questions. And then which pressing issues should OGM focus on? Food systems, th systems thinking, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the things that were up for breakouts. So uh, should, we, should we do two breakouts or should we stay in plenary? Raise your hand if you think breakouts. Two breakouts. Phil, is that you raising your hand? Yeah, you're raising your ritual hand. So that's three for breakouts. So kind of staying in plenary uh, wins the moment. And I think this is our warm up for doing breakouts. So why don't we just uh, do this again next Thursday, <clears throat> and then I think we'll have uh, we'll have more breakouts and set them up and, and, and go do it again. Uh, and then of the topics I just named or anything else, where would uh, it would be? It would be nice to talk about a topic now rather than doing the normal check-in route. Uh, so, which of these topics uh, sounds really good? John, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if this is is feasible, but it's a it, it's a kind of a spin out from a couple of the earlier conversations we had this week. The global frame on it would be: How can we replace or repair? meritocracy. If that's too hard, um, we could narrow it. There is a, a proposition from a philosopher at Chicago. She doesn't use this word, but it's kind of like uh, non-binary binary <laughs> meritocracy in the sense of she, she has this way of saying, well, you know, bad things happen to people. That's luck. You know, good things happen to people. That's more luck than we think. But, we, you know, she wanted, she wanted some kind of a thing that didn't blame people or, or, or buffered the blame for, for negativity, but uh, enhanced the, the reinforcement for, for doing something that was contributory. That was a very vague philosophical position that she outlined in a, in it's, I think it's in the New York Times, or no, it's, in, it's Eric, Ezra Klein uh, podcast. You know, I, I like where she was trying to go, but I didn't think she got there. <laughs> you know, and, and I don't know whether we could but you know, is there anything we could do that would that would re replace or reform meritocracy? Um, I love the topic also, and just want to know what what does everybody think about meritocracy before we before we try to fix or reform it? Is meritocracy a good thing or a bad thing in your head? Because there's a lot of kind of baggage around the word. So anybody, uh, Doug? Well, it seems to me that meritocracy goes along with complexity and expertise. 
And we've built a system that really requires a meritocracy. Uh, we'd have to have a different kind of system. Uh, the Greeks had the fascinating thing in Athens of drawing lots to uh, fulfill bureaucratic roles. And the result was the population had to be educated to fulfill those roles. And the roles had to be simple enough that they could be performed by ordinary people. So the interplay between the structure and meritocracy seems to me very tight. And you can't deal with one without the other. Now, the Greek clerotarian, I'm a bit link in, in our chat. Um, that so. Is that merit, uh, generally, is that meritocracy? Is sortition meritocracy? Or I, I thought meritocracy was, you're better at this, so you should do this thing uh, for us all or something like that. And that sortition or the drawing by lot of positions was not actually meritocratic, but rather more democratic. Is that- No, I, I totally agree that it, the Greek example is an anti-meritocracy approach. Okay. Uh, so they were, they were, they were trying yeah. to sort of run the run the jobs around everybody so that anybody might have but, that job. But the jobs had to be simpler. Yes, because anybody might have that job. I to totally agree. Um, uh, Parmjit, then Stacey? I was going to say there's a quote about um, what do you think about civilization? I think Gandhi or someone said, yes, it, you know, it's a good idea. And I think the same about meritocracy because at the moment, you know, you, you, you are rewarded for things that I question, are, they, are these the qualities we really want to reward people for? Um, you know, intelligence is seen as fitting in a box and it's like how much you can remember rather than actually, you know, what are the things that matter to you and what are the things that you, as, as, you, as a, a unique, human being are good at and, and can contribute to the world. And, and once we sort out those issues, maybe, you know, we're going to get closer to some kind of a world where our contributions actually matter. And I, I do um, believe that the world will be a much simpler world because we have made things that don't need to be complicated really complicated and we've made things simple like finance that actually you know that they're, they're, they're not complicated and we've made them look really complicated finance could be very very simple and it wouldn't need a huge amount of focused effort from people who understand various aspects of finance to all come together and, and figure out what are the elements that are, are making it not work and so what are the elements that could streamline it better and then you could put in, in, um, in place like a systems dynamic thing about what's going to um, work react on which bit and so what so I think we've got all the skills and we've got all the the knowledge it's just getting the right people together and you know I've spoken to people that have got solutions around investment for example but they just need like a protected space and place where they can think through all of that and I'm sure that Klaus as well you know if he got together with people in a protected place and space um, and, and we formed bridges between all these different very clever people that know their stuff mm -hmm. because we've got the technology to do all of those things um, in, in principle it's not beyond our capabilities. Uh, thank you for, in particular, your note about the sort of complexification of stuff that could be much simpler. I think that's really, that crystallized a few things in my head. I appreciate that. And I agree with you. Um, let's go Stacy, Klaus, me, Eric, Eve. I, I was just going to say that I think one of the things that would have to shift is the value that we place on certain roles or the lack of value that we place on certain roles. Um, for example, musicians. Every musician I know, except you know the, that do it full time, they're poor. They're not. They, they they work for tip jars, 
and yet they provide a really valuable service. So if we're gonna use a system of meritocracy, we have to place a little bit more value on some of the roles that we haven't always placed value on. Which is sort of the word merit, right? It's merit is kind of a form of value and value judgment. So it, it buries itself right in there. Um, Klaus, go ahead. Yeah, on the surface, meritocracy um, is of course the most uh, uh, logical way for uh, a society to organize itself, you know, to bring talent to the forefront. The Chinese society is actually probably the most advanced in, uh, in uh, a meritocracy. Uh, you know, they have this annual competition as to who gets to go to college. Um, and uh, and the, you, you see stories from a, from a small village that is honored because one of theirs uh, won the competition and gained access to a university education. Um, but when you look at, uh, and, and so, so the, the idea of bringing, of finding and, and promoting the most talented people in the society, you know, is uh, it's just very powerful. And I think the Chinese are going to run away from us because they, they that is a you know two thousand year old uh, habit that the, the, the Chinese developed there. But meritocracy, and this is what Duck is also uh, uh, mentioning, is embedded uh, in, in a bigger system, in a larger system. And so the first thing that comes to mind is access to education, access to childhood development, you know, developing the potential of a person. Um, and that falls instantly into this hierarchy you know, of uh, existing wealth perpetuating itself. Um, and, and, and concentrating. So it, it, it requires uh, a, a, a rigorous political system and structure like the Chinese have developed uh, and, and, and the Vietnamese and other Asian cultures in particular. Um, that, but then on the other hand, when you look at every major innovation, every major breakthrough in the last, in, in, the, nine, in the 20th century came from the United States really. You know, so so how does that fit together then, um, where where um, where we have these amazing advances, of course. So I mean, it's a really complex uh, 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 issue that that uh, uh, has has pros and cons. But I believe a meritocracy at the end of the day uh, is is the way for a, a society to organize itself. Um, let me jump in and then uh, Eric. And um, in particular, I think, because what you just said, Klaus, fits what I wanted to put in the conversation, um, which is, uh, I, read, I read a book called The Institutional Revolution. I mentioned it once or twice long ago on our OTM calls, and it's about the pre-modern British aristocracy and the institutions they had. And it's really interesting because uh, it turns out that um, the British aristocracy um, raised stupid children like, like if you were an aristocrat, you did not teach your child the modern equivalent of an MBA or anything so that they could run the family businesses. They learned Latin and Greek. They did the grand tour of Europe. They were gentle people, mostly gentle men. Women didn't get an education then. Uh, at primogeniture, like, like obeying the laws of the aristocracy of inheritance was primary and you could be a moron and a cruel beast. But if you were first in line, you got all the power, all, all of everything, including the seat in parliament and everything that belonged to your, your parent, your dad. Um, and the British Navy was like the aristocracy. You inherited naval posts. The British Army was not. You could purchase a commission in the British Army. The reason for this was trust at a distance. In the army, you can send observers who stand on the hill and look at the bar at the battle and you can tell who's shirking their duty. You can tell who turned away. In the Navy, everybody's off like in a, on an ocean far away in a storm fighting and they can sort of say, see what's happening in battle, but you don't know. You can't really send an observer who's gonna, gonna make it back. So everybody needed to know that when, when Sir Walter Raleigh was halfway around the world doing his thing, that he was acting on behalf of the crown and not on his own interest. And so they, uh, the, the, the author of this book coins the term hostage capital. 
that the aristocracy were basically hostages to the crown because they had no useful skill. If, if they did something terrible and committed treason, they'd be beheaded, no big deal, you're done, and then the title might be taken away. If you did something you know, bad otherwise, if you were disloyal to the crown and were cut away, you then had a really expensive estate in the middle of nowhere, a circle of friends who wouldn't talk to you ever on pain of whatever, uh, no useful skills, et cetera, et cetera. So you were hostage to the entire system. And the expenses you had to keep up for your estate and the parties and the hunting with the hounds kept you trapped in, economically trapped in the system, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this to create loyalty so that everybody was actually acting toward the crown. And this system, which is not meritocratic in the least, gives us rule Britannia and 200 years of domination of like the global economy in some weird way. So, and, and, and idiots, idiots were in charge of battalions and corporations and this kind of thing because inheritance, right? And the monarchy is very, it's, it's all about inheritance and I don't understand monarchies. Like I'm like, why through luck of birth, Never mind. Anyway, finding our way to meritocracy is really hard because We've had long-standing systems that are completely contrary to meritocracy um, that we're used to, that we defend, that whatever, whatever. And again, we're back to the earlier part of the conversation of if somebody is uh, somebody of privilege's ox is going to be gored, they're going to do everything in their power to keep that ox safe and to protect the ox or the golden goose that lays the golden eggs or, or what have you. It's really, really hard to change these systems. And they tip sometimes dramatically like you know, China and Mao, and then when they tip, sometimes they commit further atrocities. So collectivization, uh, you know, what, what have you. Mao probably killed 20 million people. You know, Mao, sorry to keep riffing, but uh, Mao has the four pests campaign. We're gonna get rid of rats, sparrows, uh, ants, and some, I forget what the four pests are. It turns out that sparrows are really important in the ecosystem. And they, they were really effective nationwide in killing off sparrows. Um, and then all of a sudden they had locusts, they had insects all over the place that weren't being eaten by the sparrows. They had famine, all created by asinine policies created by idiots. In Russia, you have Lysenkoism and the idea that we're just going to ignore statistics because the statistics aren't really working in our favor. So we're gonna get rid of the scientists and the statisticians and put everything in charge of the, of the, of the morons. And that didn't work really well. So, so the largest countries on earth have pursued idiotic policies on all these fronts for lots of human history. I, I, and, and I would love to be part of the insurgency that inserts a new operating system, a new set of principles into civilization that takes us toward what Klaus was describing, what Doug was describing, uh, you know, uh, what Parm just describing, how, you know, how do we do this? Uh, so, sorry, long screen, but uh, uh, Eric and then Phil. Uh, so many things I want to say about this. I'm trying to be brief, I guess. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, we, we, we're not doing breakouts, so we have another uh, uh, 22 minutes. Okay, so I, the best angle at this for me, I guess, is like I wrote a governance model, which is an alternative to the UN or a complement um, in about three weeks, <laughs> which was a crazy ridiculous thing to do. But then when I thought about, okay, how to deal with who gets a vote, who doesn't get a vote, um, I did end up with meritocracy. And then I heard also about people saying these criticisms about meritocracy were, were the issues. And then I understood, okay, what is then the difference? And probably it's gonna be ethical merit and social merit, if you put that in front of merit, that might change a lot, but who determines the ethics and the quality of the ethics? And that's really difficult to determine. Mm -hmm. And I would say a mind like yours, Jerry, might really help because you've got like this multitude of understandings of, um, of systems, social systems, social dynamics. And it is very complex. And that's one of the big issues. We like simplification, of course, because that makes our lives more simple and makes systems run more smoothly, but then when it comes down to ethics, that's not such a simple level, I would say. And then I, how I set it up is the more ethical an organization is, the more power they get from the beginning on, and they can enter the more ethical they prove to, prove to be, and then gradually enter. 
and there's a, a monitoring body that could be that could be anyone adding their suggestions or criticism and and anyone can monitor so it doesn't depend on their merit but then there's another um but then one of the top organizations or parts of their organizations is the ethics and effectivity which is about in social change that's those are two very fundamental aspects i would say and then other aspect is you need neutral people who can look at the big picture take a step back and see is this running in a proper way is this according to ethics and this neutrality often isn't understood i, I would say um there's not that many people that understand how to be neutral. Yeah. Like your opinions, they make part of how you make decisions. And I know I can be opinionated, but I also know how to step back and really put my own opinions on the background and really completely omit them from my judgment and how I make decisions and how I'm open to others. So I guess, yeah, those are a few important stuff and I think the last part that I want to say is I, th I think there is not a clear distinction between what I would kind of call popularocracy and meritocracy. Mm -hmm. Someone who is popular doesn't necessarily have merit. It seems they have merit and they get married because people like them but that's not how it really works and to make that distinction more clear, to have just some books of really good writers that would write simple principles which indicate what is good merit, what's bad merit, let's say, or what's good quality merit and what's bad quality merit could change a lot, I would say, if these books get spread. So that's my take on it. Love, love that, Eric, in so many ways. And at the end, you reminded me of the introduction to uh, Danny uh, Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. It is Kahneman, right? Yeah. Um, and in the, and he says, look, I'm on the Israeli Defense Forces um, officer qualification team, and we watch these high pressure simulations where uh, officer candidates are put through all kinds of crap, and then we vote on which ones should make it through into officer thing and et cetera. And, we, I've been doing this for a decade and we did studies. We started to see who actually turned out to be a good leader in the field. And it turns out that there was zero correlation, zero statistical correlation between our choices of the, of the future officers who were gonna be awesome and who actually performed well in the field. Yet we didn't get rid of that committee and we keep doing that work. That's in the intro to his book. And I'm like, holy shit. And, and what you just said, Eric, is like, that's sort of the difference between a popularocracy and a meritocracy. It's one of the differences. It's like that person looks like a leader and they yelled at the right time and everybody followed them and maybe that was good. And, and, and maybe that wasn't good for us. And, and so how to know like upfront what's actually good for humans and how it's gonna work is a, is a complicated systems upon systems kind of issue. Uh, but how we get there, I think is a lovely, uh, a lovely question to try to tackle. And sorry, Phil, I had to put that in before turning over the mic to you. No worries at all. It was great, great insight. And um, Eric, I'd love to, to read your, your work on that on alter, alternative based on the UN model. Um, that's one thing that really kind of sticks with me with meritocracy. Like, as Klaus mentioned, China is probably the closest to a successful meritocracy because they have such a, a clear societal structure, societal kind of understanding and definition. Um, that being said, China is one of the world's leading producers of greenhouse gases and emissions, carbon uh, emissions. So how do we, well, I guess one thing I want to make sure we focus on is stepping back from kind of a Western model of what merit should be. And I think everyone is, is kind of along those lines, but like looking at communities and in terms of simplifying, looking at indigenous communities that are living in a much kind of more regenerative um, way with each other and, and with the, the planet. And that may seem simple and maybe not worth merit to some people, but I feel like those systems are a much more, it's a difficult transition, but the direction we should be moving in is, is, is that way. And outside of the, going back to the societal piece, I think the kind of national identities are diminishing a bit. Like there's this kind of raising digital society, digital culture that transcends borders. So how we define 
that society and what 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 merit means to that society i think is crucial um oh shoot i just lost the the thought i had because i typed something else in for notes that's what happens when you pay, try to pay attention to too many things at once um just this whole notion about what is the, oh i know what i was going to say thank you Oof. um i guess i'm thinking myself um, in some cultures, I think in indigenous cultures, and I'm saying this completely as a naive outsider, uh, merit is earned through wisdom, which is earned through simply aging and participating in community and having been through a lot of stuff and absorbing ancient wisdom and wisdom along the way. And that's a, that's a great form of merit. And there are many cultures in which elders are revered or have authority, period. There are some cultures in which elders simply have the say and nobody gets to say anything else, which like is a, is a breakdown of society. And in Western society, we so prize youth and we've so marginalized and deprecated elders that they have almost little, little of that role. Even though as I glance over toward DC, I will note that everybody we're angry at in DC is like over 70. Uh, like everybody, including like, you know, the justice of the SCOTUS that people would like to have retire right now so that they can be replaced with somebody who's not over 70, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, these are all like older folk uh, running the place, which is kind of really strange. Um, so other, other thoughts on this topic? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, except you're muted. You're trying to find your Zoom window. There we go. I think it was, I, have, I had a weird comparison in my mind where this popular democracy and meritocracy, they're different in a way also like Machiavelli is often seen as the one that thought the uh, means justify the end. <laughs> like that's how he's often summarized. But actually he, he was thinking about power. He's one of the best thought leaders or uh, philosophers about power. And he's mis misunderstood as someone having really bad ideas. What he did, he analyzed how does power really work. He went into the depth of it. And then it's summarized as, oh, it's that guy. He thinks that the end justifies the means. He's a really bad guy, philosophically speaking. <laughs> so there, it's a weird comparison. It doesn't really hold, but there's something about how depth often is lost in how, um, how a certain term is being seen. Like meritocracy is not really meritocracy. I think also same may, maybe with democracy. What we currently have is that really democracy? Because democracy was created in Athens when there were like a few hundred thousand people that could vote. It's a completely different system than billions of people voting through supposed democracy. Well, like India has the world's largest elections, you know. Huh? India has the world's largest elections by far. Like the number of humans who, whose vote has to be collected in India is astonishing. Absolutely yeah. like staggering. And then the, the distance between that vote and really affecting policy is much different than in essence when it was a much smaller community. Everybody could have their say. You actually could affect policy. It's not possible anymore. So I wonder, is that actually still democracy? Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, um, two things about democracy. One is there are so many weird things about American democracy that I don't think we're very democratic at all. Although we hold ourselves up as the world's most democratic country. Like they were, we're founded on democracy, of course, um, except uh, all the things that are being done right now to prevent democracy from actually working are, are examples of, of how, how broken it is and how we break it on purpose. Uh, John, did you want to jump in? Uh, yes, thank you. I uh, <clears throat> just wanted to say, obviously, this thing is big and complex. And we're not going to resolve it, not only in this meeting, but probably in several meetings. I mean, fix meritocracy or decide our opinion on meritocracy. But a strategy is to peel off areas of activity and areas of rights and areas of so on. So an interesting one is uh, driving. So not everyone can have a driver's license. You know, there's a floor. If you do certain things, no, you're below the floor, you know, but a lot of people can have a driver's license. So that's a, that's an interesting kind of thing. You know, look, there's a floor capability and, and you got to and you repeatedly get retested on that floor capability or else, you know, you lose certain privileges. Mm -hmm. Another interesting thing, which I know you're uh, you'll be up on, Jerry, is 
traffic circles versus traffic um, signs. You know, Europe's much better at using traffic circles than we are. We put up a traffic circle, and then we put stop signs on it because we think, you know, you don't trust. But the cool thing about traffic circles is, hey, guess what? You're going to have to pay attention here. <laughs> you know, we're going to trust you, you know, to do that. And lo and behold, the, the personal story about this is when I, when I developed a relationship with someone who was Swiss and I had to start spending time in Switzerland, I had learned right away <laughs> that Swiss drivers are much better drivers because they have to be. They're on a two lane twisty mountain road with cows coming across it. You know, if they weren't much better drivers, they're, well, they, those get eliminated, you know, not, not, they don't lose their license. They lose their, you know, so that it was just interesting, that whole interaction between the requirements, the floor, the signaling system, you know, the feedback system from uh, how does this work? And we have grossly under optimized how we do that. Uh, it, this has implications for how we define guild journeyman, how we define school, how we define education, uh, even even things like the the economy and um, cryptocurrency <laughs> to stretch. But I mean, you know, that idea of let's not try to fix the whole thing. Let's not try to do post capitalism. Let's have this fiat area over here that's operating kind of traditionally badly, but let's not try to completely replace it. Let's set something else up over here that partially replaces some of the functions so we can have a, a laboratory and so we can cross fertilize um, between the two because no conception, no matter how well we brainstorm, we'll fix it up front. You're also lighting a, another little bulb in my head, which is that meritocracy could mean Let's find a really equitable, fair way to pick our next leaders who will tell us what to do. Yep. And one of the things that's happening right now is sort of large-scale decentralization of everything. And what you just reminded me of is my own thesis about design from trust, inspired by people like Hans Mondermann, who did traffic calming, and a bunch of other people who said, what if we trust humans? And the result of systems designed from trust is that everybody is co-responsible for the outcome of the system. That's what happens in a system designed from trust. Wikipedia is designed from trust. So we all, you know, whoever is contributing to Wikipedia or reverting bad changes or whatever is, in, is doing the work of making Wikipedia better. And that's, that's sort of not a meritocracy. That's just like a duocracy, which is somebody's coined that term already. It's like whoever did the best, did the work and, and, and kept doing the work. And, and in the middle of all that, the rules of the system are essential. Um, and to go back to Wikipedia, the rules of the system for Wikipedia emerged from Wikipedia's own work and are a, a series of things like neutral point of view, uh, no original work. Uh, there's a, a bunch of kind of presets for how Wikipedia works that are, you know, are now time tested, but were new 20 years ago when they were busy like birthing Wikipedia that are very Wikipedia specific in many cases because it's supposed to be an encyclopedia, so it has to be neutral. And that's interesting, but you don't borrow that rule if you're not trying to do neutrality. But, but I think that how communities de devolve authority and responsibility for the work of what the community is up to and then build up their operating principles is really an essential thing to understand also. And I think maybe studying that and finding out who's done really good work on that. I mean, one of the ways I, want, I would like OGM to work in the world is that we're not trying to like reinvent meritocracy or, or democracy or how these things work, but there's just a ton of people out there in the world who've been reinventing them. Let's find the best of, let's make them much easier to implement and use, and let's popularize them in ways uh, that we don't have an engine to popularize yet. But, but if we do our work right, our resource becomes really useful and people will be like, oh, I need to figure out a group process because we're stuck. Let's go to the thing that OGM built as a resource and that'll help us get through. Klaus, over to you. Yeah, another term that sort of fits into this meritocracy idea is the technocrat. And um, there, there has been an attempt you know, to insert technocrats into government because they know what needs to be fixed and they know how to fix it. But then <clears throat> that hasn't worked so well really either because the overarching direction, the social structure of the system uh, is often overlooked by the technocrat and technocrats um, most often operate in silos because you now they're specialists in a specific field 
but they don't fully see the entire picture. So there is this interplay between technical skills and, 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 and know-how and, uh, and systems-wide or systems impact uh, 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 outcomes that need to be considered. I think the, the Biden administration, for example, has done a really good job in, in laying out some big picture uh, uh, things that need that require fixing, like climate change, like uh, uh, poverty alleviation, uh, hunger alleviation, and so on. Um, and so every cabinet is, which is basically the technocrats sitting in the cabinets, are working towards a common, a common outcome. The Chinese are actually amazingly efficient at this. Um, I mean, they're coming in from way behind in, in the development of the, their energy structure, for example, but they are leading in uh, nuclear technology right now. There is this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's, it's the salt immersed uh, nuclear reactors, um, you know, which, uh, yeah, and, and they, they are leading and they have you know, dozens of these uh, plants under development already. So the Chinese and, um, will, um, will advance you know, in, in, in a very short period of time, but at the, at the same time, their role within the community of nations is really poorly defined in their own mind, right? They don't really see um, a, a constructive role or a, a role that we would consider constructive in the in the community of nations yet you know at least not transparent to us um so so how does this how does philosophy you know come into play to to guide technocrats towards uh the the where humanity is moving towards so, so this this kind of link is um i think is is really in need of definition um, we're reaching the end of our call, and I, I have to bounce a, a little bit before the half hour. Um, but thank you for raising all these questions about meritocracy. This was really fun. This is a, a good, dis a good and useful discussion. Uh, and I just realized that in my brain there was a thought called questioning meritocracy, and I just put a link to it in the Mattermost chat because there's you know there's a thought meritocracy inevitably becomes oligarchy. Uh, which comes out of the book Twilight of the Elites, America After Meritocracy, which was written by Christopher Hayes, Chris Hayes about them. He also wrote, uh, he's kind of, quiet, uh, he's kind of uh, echoing a, a book from 1956 called The Power Elite, which was written by Wright Mills, uh, which is linked back to Behemoth, the structure and practice of national socialism, which is an article about the Nazi party. That's all I'm just putting from my, my brain and I didn't screen share right there, but. Those things were all threaded together. Um, any last words for this call? This has been great fun, thank you. We will experiment again with the format for next week. So I'll create a, a new tab for next week's call in the spreadsheet or erase this one. I don't know exactly what I'll do, but uh, we'll go in and, and populate it and see how that works. Uh, so thanks very much, everybody.